بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Firstly, I should have done this in last night's lecture, but we'd like to thank profusely Sheikh Ismail Kamda for his beautiful book on the themes of the Quran, and uh, we hope that it's of great benefit to everybody, and we pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala conveys the reward of whatever we are learning. To Sheikh Ismail, and uh, we pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala blesses him with a long, healthy life in the obedience of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, so that we can get more Islamic content and guidance and benefit from his knowledge. Masha Allah. Into tonight's discussion on the second juz of the Quran, brothers and sisters in Islam, if you recall, we are discussing Surah Baqarah, which is pretty much two and a half juz of the Quran, and since the second juz is a continuation of Surah Baqarah, it is very closely linked to yesterday's discussion um, on the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, in Surah Baqarah, Juz 1, we discussed the uh, importance of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a couple of stories. One I didn't mention last night was of Adam alayhi salatu salam and uh, shaitan. So shaitan was instructed to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command like all the angels and make sujood to Adam alayhi salatu salam. And obviously he disobeyed, and that was the start of the fight between man and shaitan. And because shaitan was kicked out of Jannah, remember his intention wasn't sincere from the beginning. He knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to create his khalifa on earth, his representative on earth, the one who's to establish the deen of Allah on earth. And he wanted to be that one, right? But what happened was that... Because his intention wasn't sincere and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that all his worship was to achieve that objective. It was not to achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be the the favorite of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in our hearts. Allah says in the Quran, we know what he whispers to himself in his heart. So because our intentions are known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we speak and think in our hearts are known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perfect example, brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm bringing you to divorce. And that's one of the topics we're discussing tonight. Um, we see very, very often uh, at the Islamic family court and beyond that couples get divorced and now the partner who has the children withholds the children from the other partner as a form of punishment. And the fabulous excuses we hear, oh, the children are sleeping, oh, I can't send your child because he or she's potty training, oh, um, I know they're feeling sick, or the best one, because we don't want to take responsibility for being the bad guy. So what we say, oh, the children don't want to come, like small children have the ability to make those kind of decisions, or oh, the children have plans. Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sleeping? Do you honestly think that those statements and those claims are going to go unnoticed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And sadly, when we uh, when we do all of these things, the repercussions and the implications are going to hit us in our lives. And uh, this is why I'm saying, so let us not bluff ourselves. Oh, no, I'm sincere. Oh, even a better one. No, I'm dating this girl, Imam, because uh, my intention is to get married. Brother, if your intention was to get married, you wouldn't be screwing around. You, you'd get married, right? Um, I take the opportunity to congratulate my younger brother, Qari Salahuddin, mashallah, who got married on Monday. That's now yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him and all those who are getting married, and all those who have recently gotten married, and all those who are married with happy, happy lives. The bottom line, the best advice that I can possibly give you is be sincere, be true, be real, be yourself. Don't pretend to be somebody you're not because that facade is going to come crumbling down when the novelty of nikah wears off and you now fall into a state of complacency and then the real you comes out and then your spouse will realize and hang on, this is not who I got married to, this is somebody else and then your life, life start falling, starts falling apart. May Allah give us tawfiq and understanding. Remember the hadith, famous hadith, that our actions are motivated and ultimately judged by our intentions and every person will truly only get that which he intended. Back to our story, Shaitan made the intention of what? That he wants to be the vicegerent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was worshipping Allah to achieve position. His intention was not sincere. So, because his intention was not sincere, he got the insincerity of his intention. He didn't achieve 
what he wanted to achieve. So that was one of the themes in Juz 1. To Juz 2, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues with regards to obeying the commands of Allah and the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, in this Juz, we actually have a host of fiqhi instructions and laws and commands of the Sharia that have been revealed. Some of these laws include uh, the instruction to eat only that which is halal and in fact tayyib. Tayyib means that we don't only eat that which is halal specifically, but we avoid stuff that is contaminated, stuff that is doubtful, something that is tayyib, right? So let us try to eat healthy and wholesome food healthy and wholesome food this is the thing so i'm not advertising now against junk food i'm not denying that it's halal right um obviously if it's halal and certified right but let us avoid eating junk food a home-cooked meal by a, a a wife or a mother or a father who cares for you and truly wants you to grow is so much so much more wholesome and has so much more barakah and so much more blessed than going to eat food at an outlet which is prepared specifically and purely to make money off of you they don't even care whether the ingredients are healthy or not they only care about it tasting good and people wanting it all right may allah give us tawfiq and understanding so the instruction to eat halal only is given in the second juz also we discuss the qibla and the salah now each of these topics can obviously take an extensive discussion and i already have six and a half minutes down into this lecture and only five minutes left so I can't go into a detailed discussion of the Qibla, but a very important point to remember with regards to the Qibla is we don't worship the Kaaba. We worship Allah facing the Kaaba. It is a sign of unity. And by the way, um, the Qibla is the direction in which we pray to face Allah, to, 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 to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the meaning of the word Qibla, the direction of prayer. If you don't know which direction is the Kaaba and you do Taharri, Taharri means you estimate more or less in which direction it could be, then whichever direction your heart settles on as that is the correct direction of, of Qibla, that is the Qibla for you. That is the direction you pray. And when you're inside the Kaaba, interestingly enough, you can pray in any, any direction. You can, but obviously the sunnah is that you walk in through the door and you walk straight to the next wall between the two pillars and that's where you perform your salah. That's where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa performed his salah when he entered the Kaaba. May Allah give us that opportunity once in our life at least, inshallah, that we can um, visit the Kaaba Sharif, but actually enter the Kaaba, the Mubarak Kaaba, Allahu Akbar. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Also, Islamic criminal law and its importance has been discussed. Now there's a long discussion about human rights and... Uh, What's it called? Capital punishment and corporal punishment. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knowing and the wise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah says in the Quran, in more than one place, that Allah knows and you don't know. Allah understands, you don't understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is complete. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed a system of capital and corporal punishment for sins. And by the way, certain sins only. And secondly, it must be given publicly. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with regards to zina, for instance, a married person making zina. Brother, you are so absolutely ungrateful. And the lady as well, so absolutely ungrateful. Because Allah has given you a halal spouse. And you still chose a haram option. Right? I'm going to add this, that many women, and specifically women, because guys are not dumb enough to do this. I'm not saying you're dumb. Please don't understand. What I'm saying is that guys won't do this because for us, that's just dumb. Right? Because that's depriving yourself. Right? Women use deprivation of intimacy as a punishment. My sister in Islam, you do not have that right. The hadith of Rasulullah is clear. Even if you're busy cooking and your husband calls you to the bedroom, you should leave the stove and go to see to your husband's needs, right? Because at the end of the day, that is the halal option, the halal avenue that Allah has provided for us. And a surefire way of destroying your relationship is depriving your husband of intimacy. Because I promise you, if there's no food at home, you're going to go and buy takeaways. That's how it works. Sad, sad thing that we're hearing, brother. So many people are cheating on their spouses. You've got Muslim men right up to Hufad of Quran on Tinder. Bruh, on Tinder, really, man? 
Really, man, this is what you do with your free time. May Allah give us tawfiq and understanding. And then the wife deprives the husband of, of, of intimacy. He's a human being. He's got uh, sexual disease, uh, needs and desires. I almost said disease, not disease, right? La ilaha illallah. May Allah protect us. And then what happens? His nafs overpowers him and he starts looking at pornography. And then you want to say, no, he's a bad person. He's not a bad person. He made a mistake and a sin. But what was, the, what was the, 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 the starting point? The starting point was you deprived him of his right. You paid mahar for that. That's why I'm saying that when it comes to, to, to punishment, the, we talk, sorry, back to the zina story. It is a great sin in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has given a man specifically four wives option and you still manage to make zina. Brother, la ilaha illallah. Think about yourself. May Allah give us tawfiq and understanding. Make tawbah, my dear brother and my dear sister in Islam. We've got ladies. La ilaha illallah. The stories, I can't even tell you. I'm not willing to tell you this. But the stories we're hearing is devastating. It's beyond devastating. Beyond devastating, the stories that I've heard of people cheating on their and the way, Allahu Akbar, worst is when spouses facilitate it for their spouses. How do you sleep at night? How do you sleep at night? And the problem comes where? Because we do not have the establishment of the Islamic Sharia with regards to these things. Allah says, When you are punishing someone for zina, let a group of the believers witness that punishment. Why? If you see someone's eye being taken out because he gouged someone's eye out, are you going to go and do it? You'll never do it. If you see somebody getting stoned to death for zina, are you going to go and do it? No. If you see someone lashed publicly for drinking alcohol, which has become very common, by the way, in the Muslim circles. If you see someone being lashed publicly for drinking alcohol, are you going to go and drink? No, you won't drink. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referred to these punishments as nakal. Nakala min Allah. Naka, you steal and it's a minimum amount, by the way, not just anything. You steal a certain amount of, 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 of uh, something worth a certain amount of money. Then your hand gets cut off. You need It needs to be proven, firstly. And secondly, your hand being cut off, my brother and sister in Islam, if somebody sees your hand being cut off, and the Prophet ﷺ, when somebody interceded on behalf of another lady called Fatima as well, he said, please, oh, she's an old woman, she's very respectable in the community, she made a mistake, can't be overlooked. He said, Wallahi, if Fatima bint Muhammad had to steal and cut her right hand off too. No mercy. And no concessions. This is why the Sharia is so important because there's no mercy and no concessions when it comes to punishment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wala ta'khudkum ra'fatun fi deenillah. Let mercy for people and care and compassion for people not overpower your your, your ability to establish the deen and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has called these punishments nakal. Nakal is a punishment that is served publicly so that other people can take lesson and not do the same thing. Our time is already up. I can't believe it. Wallahi, 12 minutes, subhanAllah. Right. Then laws relating to fasting in the month of Ramadan have been revealed as well, which we will discuss further on and in other programs during the, the, the month, inshaAllah. Um, laws with regards to jihad and warfare. Brothers and sisters in, in Islam, I'm going to ask you a simple question. Have you ever heard of Muslim Mujahideen coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder? No. You know why? Because we don't go and break any laws. We don't do anything that sits on our conscience because there are strict, very, very strict rules of engagement. Now is not the platform to discuss it. Extremely strict rules of engagement when it comes to jihad. And therefore, there's no conscience troubling us. There's no us going out and massacring and killing and slaughtering people mercilessly and innocent women and children and old people. There's no such thing in Islam. Anybody who does that is not practicing on the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, how do we believe the media with regards to Muslim extremists and terrorists doing these kind of things? How would a Muslim mujahid do stuff like that when your purpose in, in jihad is to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing that is directly against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then thirdly, how do you believe the, the media in the first place. If the media was in our control, we were, we were giving our version of the story, the correct version of the story, then you might still be able to believe it. But the media is not in our control. Other people are putting their own variations of what they would like to promote as the truth on. So therefore, let us just please understand, we're not uh, now fighting and arguing on behalf of those people. I'm just saying that the rules of engagement in Islam are very strict and anybody, anybody who does something in the name of jihad but contravenes the rules of Islam that is not jihad and you will face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your own, by yourself, and account, be accountable for your actions on the day of Qiyamah. Um, we also have laws with regards to Hajj and Umrah, which will also be discussed in later programs during the year, inshallah. And then the, we, got, the, we get the masarif of zakat and of sadaqah. Who qualifies for zakat? Who should we give our sadaqah to? That has been mentioned in the Quran. We've discussed this also at Masjid al ashikin in our, our uh, fiqhi discussions on zakat, um, if you remember in our adult classes. 
And lastly, which is what I started the, the discussion on today, the laws with regards to marriage, intimacy, breastfeeding, divorce, and widowhood. Right. So all these laws, what is your idda? How is the idda served, etc.? Who can give talaq? How can you give talaq? When can you give talaq? What is the consequences thereof? What is the idda? How long is the idda? For who is the idda, etc.? All these things have been mentioned. So all of this has been taught to us why. This is the big question. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been taught to us so that we are able to navigate our lives in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will conclude with a very, very important statement that I read in a fatwa from Darul Ulum Azadville. And I commend the Mufti for writing this statement. There is no prejudice in the Sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you do not know. There's no prejudice in the laws with regards to inheritance. There's no prejudice in the laws with regards to custody. There's no prejudice in the laws with regards to maintenance. There is no prejudice in the laws with regards to capital and corporal punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed this so that you and I are accurately and, um, what's it called, proficiently able to navigate our lives in a way that is pleasing to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq we must remember the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all and nobody is stopping you and I from establishing deen in our own lives and in our own homes this is what we need to do we need to endeavor to establish deen in our own lives and our own homes so ask a question nobody stops you from growing your beard are you growing your beard nobody stops you from wearing a hijab are you wearing your hijab it's so funny the ladies who are not wearing hijab are fighting about the hijab ban in, in France. Bruh, I mean, subhanallah, think what you're doing. Think what you're doing. We will go and stand and protest Palestinian rights with no sunnah libas. You're there with your girlfriend. Uh, you came in your car that you bought an interest. You're going back to your house and celebrating your great uh, ibadah in a house that you bought an interest. Um, you weren't wearing sunnah clothes, your beard was off, your upper was standing there without a scarf, and you are now celebrating the fact that you have done a great de deed in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us come back to basics. Understand the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not there to restrict us, and secondly, they're not optional. The laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are just that laws, divine laws of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, who is all wise, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La yukallifu Allah nafsan illa wusa'aha. If we are all expected to do something, it means that we're all capable of doing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never, ever, ever impose a law on somebody or, or on people in general that they can't manage. The fact that it's a law and a command of Allah that applies to everybody equally means that we can all manage it. May Allah give us tawfiq and understanding. Whatever I've said that is correct is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the barakah of his rasul and the great benefit I've derived from my teachers. Whatever I've said that is incorrect is only my nafs and shaitan and me falling prey to his whisperings. And Allah and his rasul are absolved completely. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.